Hey, folks, I have some news to tell you about today's episode. And I am, first of all, thanking you for being here. But let me just be clear that this episode was uh, a challenging one. First, it was a lot of back and forth whether I was going to do this episode or not. And I think the deeper part of whether the episode was going to be happening was what was the angle that I wanted to like understand in this conversation. As you know, Taking Off the Mask podcast is all about men of all backgrounds, ages, coming together to have conversations about these masks we wear. The front of the mask, the things we let the world see, the back of the mask, the things that we don't talk about. Like that is what the essence of the conversation is. And to really build a conversation from there. Today's guest is Matt Melvin. And um, I, I'm going to read the title of Matt's book for you just so that it, it will help to explain just, uh, well, maybe it won't explain anything, but it may explain everything. Uh, the name of his book is called Bullied Behind Bars. A gay Christian Trump supporter goes to prison. Now, I just want to read that because obviously I'm not necessarily promoting his book, but I think his book is a big part of who he is. And um, I was curious because there's a lot of words in that title. There's a lot of descriptions of who he lets the world see he is. And at least if that's the title of his book, he's gladly proclaiming those things. And I think that as our political climate has gotten so combative and it's gotten so tense and it's gotten so challenging to be able to have conversations with people who think differently than us, I really wanted to have this conversation. I don't like talk about politics a lot in my regular daily life, so I don't know who people vote for. But this fact that this man, um, that Matt, was uh, claiming and owning and wrote in the title of his book that he's a, a Trump supporter, I was actually really curious. You know, he reached out to us to talk about what he was doing. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really sure I want to do that. And then as I started thinking about what am I resisting, what am I resisting? I'm resisting because I don't want to have anybody who aspires or who um, celebrates really difficult behavior. I don't want to have this conversation. But as I thought about it deeper, I was like, well, maybe I need to have this conversation. I think what's happening in our world today, and we hear stories over and over again about young men in our communities who are um, feeling more, this is what articles are saying, right? More connected to the messaging that this other candidate has. I don't even want to say his name. You know, That's how awkward I feel even in this intro is like, I don't talk much about Trump because I don't really care about the man. I feel that Anyone who treats people the way he treats people and talks about people the way he talks about people is not a person I really want to have around me a lot. But I was actually very curious. Um, How could a person who says these are the values I hold, like I'm a Christian and I'm a man who has been bullied before, can celebrate and support someone who bullies people on a regular basis? And you may hear in the conversation how frustrating I'm not frustrated. I'm actually, I want to ask some deeper questions. And I'm also finding this little balance between like, how much am I going to create some contention in this conversation? I don't want to be in an argument. I'm not really here to argue. I'm here to learn. I'm here to get to know someone. And I think that what I heard and what I saw is typical to some things I've seen in, in the world. That people have given themselves permission to hold a belief, and even if that belief challenges their own stated values, they hold tight to that belief. I think that can happen with any belief. And so in this conversation, you're going to hear me trying to ask some questions, trying to like push this barrier to understand how how he supports this, this, this candidate. Now, we... We reached out um, because since we in- created this interview, there's a lot has happened. I mean, we had a, in this interview before the assassination attempt. I don't mean to be doing no finger quotes. Like just the, um, we interviewed, we had this interview before the assassination attempt. Now you may have lots of feelings about that. I mean, we were kind of like it happened and it went away, right? There's a lot of like stuff happening in the world today and a lot of new energy 
has taken over this um this 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 um what word am I looking for has taken over this run for presidency right now a lot of fire and energy is coming and we did want to reach out to ask you know where um he stands right now um and we weren't able to hear back about that so we are just going to release this episode now this episode may come down in a week or maybe a, a day who knows what's going to happen i'm I'm finding myself like as I was getting ready to make this intro, like, are we really doing this? Am I doing this? Why, why am I doing this? Am I? But here's what I want us to be clear about: if we don't begin to learn to have conversations with people who don't agree with us, um, healthy conversations, not to set ourselves up to be abused or ridiculed, but healthy conversations, what you will see is that he wears a mask too. He recognizes the mask he wears. Um, he recognizes that there's more to him than people can see. And I think in this conversation, you will hear um, someone who is really maybe um, trying to express how those values align or trying to uh, give them re- give them more reason of how they align. So this conversation is new for us. Um, I've never asked any guests who they voted for. I've never really known. <laughs> I Maybe I make an unconscious assumption, but in 200 episodes, talking to over 200 people from around the world, this one is one that um, I am a little nervous to release. But we're going to release it, and we're going to see just what <sighs> these healthy conversations can look like when you're talking to someone who may think uh, directly opposed to what you believe. Well, we're trying something new all the time. Uh, This is the episode with Matt Melvin. Uh, We hope you enjoy this episode. Um, We hope that you and your life are having conversations that challenge your, your thinking so that you can see how much you really believe in what you believe in. Um, And sometimes even when you bring up clear points to people who think differently, you may not get through to a resolution of where you would hope they would think, but at least you got to be able to say, I listened. And I think our world needs a lot more people who can listen. That's what today is about. So enjoy today's episode. It's new. It's different for us in this um, podcast. And um, as we move to talk to more educators around the world, I think we're going to be talking to educators from all cities and all counties and around the country, around the world. And so we are preparing ourselves to hear values that are different than ours. And that's maybe this is what this is about. It's about kicking off these new conversations because listen, everybody doesn't think about education the same way. And even though I think about education as a certain type of value system, I'm going to be meeting people who may not believe the same. So maybe this was my opportunity to test the water of what it's like to have a conversation with somebody who maybe I don't always, I don't agree with, um, but that we can be cordial, we can be kind, we can be respectful, and we cannot treat people like they are less than human. That's what I'm hoping you experience from today's episode. Um, And I hope you enjoy it. Take care, be well. And uh, listen, you can make your mask anonymously. We we shed our mask publicly. You can make your mask at millionmask.org. So enjoy today's episode, and we'll see you soon, folks. Bye now. Matt Melvin, welcome to the Taking Off the Mask podcast. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Well, the way we like to start is we ask our guests to introduce themselves. So would you introduce yourselves? What do you want folks to know about you before we jump into this conversation about masks? My name is Matt Melvin. I live in a small town called Shelburne, Vermont, uh, up by Burlington. I've been here since 1988, and I'm the author of a book called Bullied Behind Bars, A Great Christian Trump Supporter Goes to Prison. Hey, that's 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 an interesting title of a book, yeah? Yes, uh, I was incarcerated, and I wanted to share my story. And so I found it cathartic to journal my experience behind bars, and then I published it. And so my website is bulliedbehindbars.com. Well, I look forward to learning more as we jump into these masks. You know, as a guest, you get to decide who goes first. And so do you want to go first? We'll go front. We'll share front and then share the back afterwards. But you get to decide who you want to go first. I'll go with the front. 
Okay. You, do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? I'll let you go first. Okay. Well, as you as we, as we discussed before the 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 we got the record on, I was uh in all kind of tech uh, challenges, so I'm making it in the moment, like in this moment. Um. Okay. Um. The front is the things that we gladly let the world see, and um, and this mass this is what I drew. I drew this image, and the three words I wrote for the front of things that I. I gladly let the world see is dedicated, passionate, and funny. And I think the reason I thought of those today, just in the sense of like, you know, behind the scenes, you know, when we do these recordings or we do these podcasts where we, we so many things are happening, all the checklists are happening behind the scenes. And I think sometimes, and, and when things are not going well, like frustration does set in because I'm human and I feel the frustrations of like wanting to do a good job and wanting to, it to work out smoothly. And, um, but sometimes I think the dedication of like keeping my word, the dedication of like going through a task till it's finished, the, the, it's something that I, I value is a value of mine. And as much as like, I'm, I was thinking about this this week with some of our young men in our program, I was like, uh, some moments of frustration were like, and I try to see how can I keep this light? How can I keep it light? And like, don't, don't get too serious right now, right? Like, and I think it's, it's a time for serious. It's a time for, maybe it's time for letting frustration and anger be seen on the outside for your own safety and protection. And sometimes it's like, okay, where am I at right now? What, what's causing, what's beneath this frustration that's being caused? So technology, I know that I have no power to make a computer work. I can do what I know how to do. I know how to plug it in. I know how to attach all the things. I know how to, power play. I know how to do a couple of troubleshooting things, but at some point my skills end. And if I get so frustrated that I can't make something happen that is technically, I don't even know how it works sometimes, I could do myself a disservice for my own well-being. And so that's what I'm uh, focused on today. I'm not laughing as much, but I'm <laughs> I'm trying to keep a good uh, tone and energy, right? Because it's really important for these conversations. So that's the front of my math, dedicated, passionate, and funny. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. And now, now you, now it's your turn. Okay. So I did this a little bit differently. This okay. is my math. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, the three qualities I gladly let the world see are conf confidence, confrontation, and fearless. Hey, okay. That is fantastic. Did, did you make that on your face, on your own face? I went to a Path to Spirit weekend. Okay. And this is part of what we do. Saturday night, we lay down and allow our mentor to make a mask on our face. Nice. That that's fantastic. Is that use just I me mean, out of curiosity of the mask? Because yeah, that's a real mask. Is that like using paper mache or some kind of um plaster of Paris? Plaster of Paris. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Right. So at the, the the last uh event of Saturday night at 10 p.m. This is what we're doing. When I'm ready to go to bed at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it requires you to everyone to shift out of what they were hoping to be doing into what we need to be right. doing, maybe. Right. Mm. Well, the purpose of these weekends is to work on ourselves yeah. and we're not in control. So the purpose of the weekend is to allow to give up that control and not know what the schedule is, not have our cell phone, which is the biggest addiction we have and have somebody else tell us what to do. It's kind of like being in prison, really, mm. <laughs> in a way, yeah. but I can leave. That's right, that's right. Now, did you decorate it when you got back home or did you decorate it there at the weekend? No, I decorated it at the weekend. Okay, fantastic. Right on. Thank you. Thank you for bringing a real mask. I think I'm trying, I'm trying to do a, a scan back through 200 episodes. Did anybody ever have a like a real mask. I gotta, I gotta now scan my brain. Um, I think it may be the first time we've had like somebody have a mask of their own face. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Is we that, as human beings wear masks all day, every day. Mm, why, why and, and a mask is simply a barrier to not allow our true selves out. Mm. Because 
the fear of the rejection yeah. that I feel if I open myself up to the world. Fear of rejection, I think, is very powerful. Is that is that what took you to the weekend, or the weekend was not connected to? per se, a mask reveal, but was it something else that you went to the weekend for? To be more connected, to uncover, unpack a lot of that pain and hurt from being bullied throughout most of my life, both uh, high school, college, uh, when I was growing up, and then bullied while I was in prison. And being a gay man is a, is a huge challenge in a society that is heteronormative. Maybe when we get to the back, um, maybe some more of the topics around, you know, I, I I was bullied in middle school, which is where the big trauma part of bullying came in my life. And I think, uh, and, I, and I would love to learn more as we get into this. And maybe as we jump into the back, as we jump into the back of the mass, the things that we don't talk about as much, the thing we don't let people see. Um, let me try and, figure what words are present right now without even trying to write them. I think things that I'm not, yeah, I think, you know, even talking about the bullying, every time I drive by that school, my it was a middle school in Oakland where I live. Every time I drive by there, I have flashbacks of like, sometimes I'll hit the flashback that's like, oh, that one time I had these new shoes, but that was, that's a rare one. Most of them like that gymnasium because it was just where I used to every day. It was like, dreading that that guy was coming to school that day. So fear, um, I think that is a old memory that when I talk to young people, it helps me to be able to empathize when they're struggling with stuff, when they're struggling. Cause I knew what it was like not to be, feel like I could tell people, like I could tell people that I was being bullied cause I had to keep it to myself. There ain't, can't be no snitch. You can't be weak. And so all those things that happen. And so I think that the back, I would say, I'm going to say uh, definitely I'll put fear and I'm going to put um, right now uh, worry. I'm going to show those words. Um, and, and then, and in some ways I, I would say I'm going to, I started writing, can I do it? Can I do it? But I think it's like, what else do I need to do? Like I'll, I'll, I'll expand in a second. So the back fear, worry and can I do it? Can I do it? I think in growing up, I was responsible for my siblings. So I had a lot of responsibility and I, there was no room to ask, can I do it? You just have to do it. You do whatever it takes to keep them safe, to keep them fed, to keep them doing their homework, to make sure they do their chores. Like it was like a constant responsibility. Like it was like, like sitting down and just laying on the floor and just enjoying a breeze was just not a thing <laughs> that had happened too often in my in, that I can recall, right? But I think more than anything, I was always like moving. I was always doing stuff to help out at home. And I think now running an organization, it's you know I'm doing stuff to keep the organization running and do that. And I think sometimes it's like, what skills do I need to develop to be a, not only more efficient uh, but a more effective leader. I'm, I'm always constantly trying to work on that. And then I'm always like, okay, what's the next steps, you know? So fear of failure, like fear of, of, of not being able to achieve the big goals that I have in my mind, but knowing that every day I'm getting up working towards them. So, you know, there's that passion and dedication to keep going for it. Even though sometimes deep down there's this fear of like, and this worry of like, I should be farther along than I am right now. And a lot of that comes when I'm comparing, when I'm in comparison mode. So those are the ones that are on the back. Those are the ones that, you know, um, that kind of play in this background recording um, that I'm constantly trying to, like, push forward as I'm, you know, trying to do this work in the world around these masks, around this movement, around, you know, running an office. I mean, that th this was a... We just moved our office, so... Those who can see where we're right now, I'm in a new place, but you know, somewhat of a similar background, this wood panel, but uh, getting it in here, getting all the stuff in here and all that's out there is, is chaotic a little bit right now, but we're making progress, you know? So we just keep the passion dedicated. I think if I, as long as I keep focused on those things, I think it's, um, it helps, you know, that's the back of my mask. Okay. Thanks for sharing. All right. So you re are you ready to share the back of yours? All right. The back of my mask is not as exciting as the front of the mask. 
but I have anxiety, loneliness, and impulsivity on the back. You'd like to share anything about any of those? The reason I started doing men's work was to connect with men and build a bridge and make more friends and collaborate with men that are working on themselves that we don't have it all figured out. Um, so I joined a men's group uh, called men living and men living was created because men are five times more likely to commit suicide than women are. So I was actually on a call on yesterday with a man who's never had a father and was looking for a mentor. So I decided that I was going to be his mentor. So I'm excited. Congratulations. And I told him, I'm going to challenge you. Uh, I'm not going to accept coasting. I don't accept mediocrity. And I'm going to, if something doesn't sound right, you know, as Judge Judy says, if it doesn't sound right, pro probably not true. When you when you decide to be a mentor, and this is you, this is voluntary, right? It's volu you're volunteering. Yes, I'm right? not paid. No. How did you learn about the men's group, Men Alive? How did, how did you find it? Or how did... What were when you were on that search, or maybe you weren't searching and it just kind of popped up? How did that happen for you? I've been on a group for a long, long time, mm. and I've I've been a part of several men's organizations. The challenge is a lot of them are heteronormative. What I like about men living is it isn't. For the guests out there who are listening who may not know that word, and I, because I should have asked you before, but what is heteronormative um, in your definition? So that for people who don't know what it means. They they can get understand what you're saying there. Heteronormative means everything about the the organization points that it, it should be everything should be between a man and a woman. And so anything outside of that is not normal. Although normal is a very strange word. I I think I'm abnormal. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I, I don't mind. But, you know, certainly in working in other organizations, constantly hearing your wife, your wife, your wife. Now, even if as a man, if you're not married and maybe you're single, you're excluded from that template. Thank you for that definition. I really uh, like the definition. Uh, I wonder, you know, as you become a mentor now and you are now you had a mentor who supported you with your mask. I run a mentoring organization. So what is the role? And these are adult mentors. So it's a different maybe context, but maybe similar too. what is the role of the mentor in the work? Like you, you, you just accepted the role of, of as being a mentor. What, what um, responsibility did you accept? And what does that look like in kind of a week to week, month to month, or however, off, you know, however often that relationship connects. So my um, asking to be this individual's mentor had nothing to do with men living. Uh, he simply what it yesterday was his first men's meeting that he's ever come to. And he never had a father figure and he's newly married and he's going through a lot of challenges and he's looking for s some advice and somebody that will hold him accountable because he's had a, a history of being dishonest. Now, I think that's perfect because for almost half more than half of my life, I lived dishonest. I was lying constantly. And in August 2015, I was driving on 495, going 72 miles an hour, which if you know me, it's very, very slow. I've driven as, fa as fast as 130. So I love, I love driving fast. And a Lexus SUV was traveling the opposite direction, came down the embankment and literally crossed in front of my car. And I said to myself, I need to give up that old lifestyle. God was protecting me. Mm. And I made a vow to, to live a, a more honest life. The car that came, it was coming like head on towards you? No, it the car was headed east towards the ocean. I was headed away from the ocean, came down the embankment, and literally crossed in front of my vehicle. Okay. Okay. So, so both of your life. All that, the that, more that, that, reason that, to not text while you're driving mm. to did not person, do anything while you're driving did you that person should crash pay also attention to what's going on in front of you as a man who's driven thousands hundreds of thousands of miles mm. i've 
been uh, survived black ice. I've survived a black bear crossing in front of me, all deer in front of me, uh, a car. So I'm a huge proponent that individuals driving should not be doing anything other than driving. Mm. I, I imagine that that's like I thank you for the, the the context of that. And so I'm glad that th there was no accident in that moment. That the other car didn't crash, you didn't crash. Both of that you, car did crash. That car did crash in, into the woods. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. I was, but I, I survived because mm -hmm. my full attention was on the road. Mm, thank you, thank you. And so now, as you had that moment of saying, "I'm going to try and be more honest. I'm going to something has woken me up that my life was spared in this moment. I'm going to try and be more honest." what changed after that, after that moment? Like say, whether it was the same day, next day, what was the thing that you noticed first that was different? Like, Well, I had been a lukewarm Christian. I would go to church and ask for forgiveness. And then I would go back to my old deceitful uh, lifestyle. So when that near death experience, I knew that Jesus was my, my God and I was no longer in control. I am now a servant of Jesus. And so everything that I do, I have to think of Jesus. If somebody angers me on the road, what WWJD, what would Jesus do? Jesus didn't run anywhere. He walked every single place that he went. We're as a humans in a rush to do everything, so whether it's shopping at the supermarket or whether it's driving on the road, 130 miles an hour. And that that identity as a Christian, I, I identify as a Christian also. And I think one of the questions I I'm all often working through is, you know, the things that I'm I've dreamed of doing. Like you've worked in this book, right? I'm in the process of working on a book. Was the book before? I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm I don't make assumption, but was the book after the the, the near death experience and the accident? The, the book was after that. What brought the book about? What was the impetus of like the journey as that led you to jotting down these experiences that you were having, journaling, and then deciding I'm going to publish these for people to hear, learn, and, and understand? Well, I was put in prison between 2016 and 2018. Now, the offenses actually didn't occur between 2009 and 2011. The government spent six years persecuting, went to six grand juries in the state of Vermont until they finally got an indictment, spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why? Because I used other people's information to pass a background check to get a job. So I wanted to share my story about what happened to me because I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. When you made that moment of like decision that this almost had this accident, okay, I'm going to like turn my life directly and be focused on God. Did you feel something when the attack or the the the, the consequence came from this situation, the thing that you were talking about, the the thing that they had um been investigating you for? Did you feel some way about that? Like that as a person who had been trying to turn things around, then still feeling that, that. Oh, absolutely. I was angry. They brought eight police officers to arrest me. Hmm. Maybe as we, you know, we, we've talked about these masks. We've talked about like how it is in the world that we see men masks. You're on a men's team. You've been on a men's team for a while or a men's organization. I have as well. What, what do you feel is the, the, can you say the title of your book again? Because there, there is some, I imagine there's some edginess in the title, right? Bully Behind Bars, A Gay Christian Trump Supporter Goes to Prison. Yeah. That's a lot, that's a lot in there. There's a lot, there's a lot in there. There's a, right? Like It's just like me. It's a lot to unpack. That's a lot. You won't unpack. figure me out in five seconds. I'm a very complicated individual. Yeah. And I imagine many of us are. Right? I imagine a lot of the men you meet in your men's circles are also, right? There's so much more to each of us than people can see by looking at us, you know? Right. 
Can you tell me about the title? Can you tell can you tell our, our listeners about the title? Why did you choose that so complex? I mean, you packed a lot of information in that one the stream of th- of thread, right? Like, where do you get the most pushback when you go and present your book or promote your book? Where do you feel? Do you get pushback? Uh, I would say between being a Trump supporter and being gay. Mm. Is it regional? Is it a Vermont thing? Or is it just in general wherever you happen to be? Oh, I think there's pushback wherever I I happen to be. Yeah. I mean, Vermont was passed Proposition 22 last November to allow women to abort babies up until the moment of birth, which, in my opinion, and according to the Bible, is murder. I mean, as you know, that's a very contentious topic, right? And I think there's a lot of contentious topic in terms of wherever you are, right? Whether you're in Vermont on that coast, whether you're in California on this coast, right? And so I wonder, is the topic of supporting Trump connected to that as the the topic of the thing that happened in Vermont about the abortion? Or is were you supporting of that ideology even before? I volunteered for Trump in 2016. Hmm. Knocked doors in state of New Hampshire. Yeah. Are you open to sharing about that? Are you open to sharing about that? Is that something you're comfortable talking about? Oh, I'm happy to talk about anything you'd like me to talk about. It was a amazing experience. I met some amazing people. Yeah. And it was fun. It's fun confronting the opposition. Yeah. Because in my experience, a lot of people vote and don't know who what issues that individual stands for they don't know the voting record so it's as if you're voting for somebody just because they're a democrat or republican if you don't know that person's voting record or what they stand for why on earth would you vote for them so what was it that for yourself as a a christian man who has experienced bullying in the world what was it about this man that said I am going to put my my voice, my time, my energy, maybe even some of my resources in support of that. Well, he's been bullied by the Democratic Party. Is that why you felt the the uh, uh, connection? Is that what was part of things? that I feel the need that this country needs dramatic reform. When Trump was president, gas was under two dollars a gallon. There were jobs that people could have. People were able to feed their family. Prices weren't inflated at the grocery store. Today, more people are homeless than ever before. At least half of the middle class can't even afford their bills. And we need men's organizations now more than ever. Yeah. But in terms of like where you felt the the country was before, like how were you able to overlook some of the other things right because this is before you you were 2016 this is before he had taken office right so this is all we knew about him was what we knew about him in the public what was it that said to you you know what this is because he the attack from anyone you know from either, either side was was different it was not because of experiences that we had right but was that is that is that the book was written prior at right after the campaign started or was it written during the his first term? Just, just for context of it was written around 2018. OK, so in the middle of that term, in the middle of that. Term. Correct. So as you began to see things that were happening, you still felt fully in support like I've always been in support of him. Yeah. I guess that's, you know, and, and maybe that's the an interesting part that I, I'm, I'm curious about. Like when we first connected and we first had our first conversation, I was like, yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know. But I was actually more curious than anything. I was because I don't talk to many Trump supporters. I, I, they're not in my circle. They're not in my life. They're not. So I thought, you know, it'd be opportunity for me to learn. What is it? What what was it that you felt drew you, especially with the other identities that you carry, you know, like a man who's been bullied as a young man and maybe has been as an adult, a, a man who holds these values of of a higher being leading our lives, a Christian, uh, using that terminology. I, I think I was just curious, 
what where where how do you reconcile what you what you experience and what on the outside we experience from him and how he treats people how he and those and i don't need you to defend him i'm more saying like you saying yeah i'm okay with those i'm okay with how he talks to people and belittles people and degrades people i uh, i think i was just curious as to how how you pull all that together as you it maybe it maybe it's in the book. Maybe it's in the book as you talk about what are those things that make you connected to him. Um, but I, I'll be curious and maybe. Well, I don't believe you. believe he belittles people. Okay, but perception is reality, right? Yeah, I agree. So th that's, that's a good point. So in in the way you see him, he doesn't belittle people. So okay. So just in terms of like when you use the WWJD, what would Jesus do? You don't hold him to any expectations of even though he may claim that he is of a certain belief and regardless about that, but like, you don't feel that that is important or, or do you, is there some way that you've uh, reconciled the idea that, Oh, you know what? It doesn't matter that he, let, let's, let's move, remove the word belittle because that was my word, but I would say kindness. He doesn't treat people with kindness. I don't know any politician that treats people with kindness at all. I volunteered for a, a woman who ran for office in New Hampshire. I had to go to some of the political events. I've never met so many fake people. It, it was not anything that I had any interest in ever doing. So again, I think that was sort of the mask, right? Everybody that went to these things was putting on a mask. Mm. They were pretending to like you, to get what they want. In mm. my experience, people only want to be friends with you as long as there's some benefit, usually financial. And once that benefit goes away, so does the friendship. I've found very, very few people that want to be friends without some catch. Mm. That's a, a very interesting thought. I mean, I, I think, do you feel that people are attracted to that energy from Trump because he, in, in that context of like not being fake, he says directly what he feels about you. You don't, have to, you're not Correct. wondering what he feels about. You know, interesting. He's so, charismatic. Hmm. He, people love to hear him speak. Yeah. And he says what's on his mind. Hmm. There's a old saying in Christianity called itchy ears. And that means most people want to hear how great you are, how wonderful it is to be in your uh, among you, and and they don't want to hear brutal honesty mm. because brutal honesty sometimes hurts. But how am I helping somebody if I'm sugarcoating reality? Mm. It doesn't help anybody because that's what flattery is. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so then, if you, I mean, I think our minds are powerful beings, right? Have you seen the movie Inside Out? Have you seen the, either part one or part two? The movie Inside Out. I haven't seen it. Are you, are you a movie watcher? I'm not. You're not a movie watcher. Okay. Um. The the the, the premise is that there's this our minds that we call it. They call it a headquarters, right? So there's these characters. The first five characters were joy, anger, fear disgust and sadness those are the first five characters and so they call this idea the ice idea of inside i was like what if the inside of your brain we could see it like on the outside we could see what was happening in our minds as we were going through stuff right and i wonder like this idea of like speaking what's on your mind like it's like hmm this thing is making me come one of these emotions is popping up disgust anger fear whatever and i'm going to speak out about it with no filter whatsoever, right? With no filter of like, is the are these words going to hurt people? Are these words going to harm people? Are they going to make people feel feel a certain way? And I think that's where my question is. Yeah, okay, maybe you are speaking on what's on your mind, but that's what you normally do when you have no frontal lobes, right? When you're like, I have no frontal lobes of controlling what's going to come out of this mouth. So it just goes straight from here to the mouth, as opposed to like, hmm, that sentence, that phrase, that attack, that, that, that's that, that comment 
it may be not be helpful here. It may not be kind here. It may not be respectful here, right? Even though it's on what's on my mind, right? Like in traffic, right? Like, hmm, what am I going to say? Am I going to like channel a, a higher being of myself in traffic? Or am I going to just be like, beep, 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 beep. Am I, am I, what, what happens between the time I think it to the time it pops out of my mouth? And maybe if I'm in the, my own car with my windows rolled up, I may say more than I would if my windows were down and and I thought that people could hear me. You know, I, I wonder in those things. Um, so, like, as a man who, when you talk about being bullied in high school and then in college, for yourself, if you're willing to share more about that, was it physical bullying? Was it emotional? Was it verbal? Like, that's a curiosity I have about, you know, as you mentioned, some of the bullying you experienced. Emotional bullying, physical bullying, because I was a heavy guy who was overweight for most of my life. I only see your shoulders now, so I, I don't know. Are you, are, are you? Would you say you're not overweight now? Like, no, okay. I'm not. I'm not overweight anymore. Yeah. So what? 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 What changed? What? What? What shifted for you that, or in your life? What? What was the shift from that? Either that state of being, if you, if those are the things that you felt you bullied about, what caused the shift? Eating better. I used to go out to eat five times a week. Mm. Exercising more. Writing down what I eat, keeping a food journal, and just feeling better about myself, and not allowing other people's opinion of me matter. It doesn't matter. I will never live up to other people's expectations. I love myself and I know that God loves me and that's all that matters. I don't need other people's flattery or affirmations. Do you feel like that is, and maybe you, you know, I don't know, how, do you speak to other Trump supporters or do you, or do you kind of isolate yourself? Do you like just keep that, Thing to yourself or do you talk about this often do you talk about your support often to people i talk about my support all day every day. yeah and i have friends that are on both sides yeah and i think that's important i i think that i love a healthy debate as long as it's done in a calm rational manner yeah i'm not going to have a conversation with somebody who's going to scream but I certainly think the amount of violence that's going on in this country, especially the anti-Israel movement, is a is abysmal. 176 grave sites were ripped out in New York City. Jewish. But this is nothing new. The Jewish people have always been persecuted. And I feel that I, I've been persecuted for most of my life as well. And so the, the feeling of of what things that are, are, are values to you, of you, what things you support are connected to kind of the things that you've experienced also growing up. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Fair to say? So, it, and maybe just like, as we think about, like, as we connect to these masks, we're talking about this idea of where do we get to be more our full self? And as you do men's work and you probably experience men who come for the first time, like if you've never trusted men, it, like I've, I've been on a men's team for 14 years. So I'll speak to that context. Like, I met men who've come and they're like, what is going on here? Men are talking about feelings. They're talking, they're, they're hugging each other. What's going on here? Right? Like if they have never been in a space like that, it can seem odd, strange, weird per se. Right. But maybe for some people, they've been looking for it for all. They've been like, where has this been my life, whole life? Right. And I think you can imagine the different places that you, wherever those men have come from in their life. If they said, if their belief is that men, or should not talk about their feelings, should keep everything to themselves, should bottle everything up, repress all their feelings, then they may operate from that context, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other side, if they have been taught or believe that, no, this is healthy, normal, this is what should be happening on a regular basis, then they would come to that space and feel like a breath of fresh air, like, wow, wow, right? And they may still feel some uncomfortable because they may feel, can I, can I, can I, can they trust, can I trust them? Can I trust them in that space? So for you as who talks about these topics, who you probably say you meet people all the time who may not agree or there's contentiousness all, all the time about your, your book and your title. As you 
when people bring up the context of 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 correlating kindness and love with also the things that you may have heard people push back on 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 who you support how do you in a gentle even kind way respond to that cuz i imagine that there's a lot in there about that about how do, how do you say that you support this person who is often from the outside appearance to others who may not believe how you believe see it as not kind and not loving not not channeling a a, a sense of r- love and care thank you for sharing your opinion that's what i would say oh i see i see i see got it got it everybody has their own truth and there's only one truth and that's jesus christ but your truth is is the context of the truth I see what you're saying. That's okay. So if the, if the content of the truth is that the, the word that was passed down to us to, to live by, you just, in your, in the way you operate with people who may disagree or who read the topic of your book and be like, what the heck, or whatever they say, may say to you, you imagine you had lots of conversations about it. When you say, thank you for your opinion, do you feel like there's just no need to try and justify anything like that? It's just, you just kind of go with that context. Like, correct. No, I see. How about your friends? Because you say you have friends who, so when you, maybe you have more conversation with your friends than with random people in the, you know, in the, in, in a book, bookstore or somewhere where you may be promoting your book. What, what about you and your friends? Do you all have talks about that? Do you go past that? Thank you for your opinion. Or do you have a. We focus on things that we agree on rather than things uh, that we don't agree. Right on. Right on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for thank you for being willing to answer some of these questions. I'm I I I I, I said that you to you and I told Katrina. I said I'm really curious. I, I think it's something I need to learn because I think I'm I'm curious as to what's happening in our world. I mean, you talked about the violence, um, and I think there's lots of layers of violence in our world, you know. And I think um, I'm concerned about the violence that that we can that I personally can navigate, meaning. I can control what I say, what I do. I can control, I can control, I can't control someone else, right? So even I get frustrated at what I called in the earlier part of the conversation, I said belittling. And when you said, well, I don't think he belittles. I'm like, oh, well, that's right. That is my, it's my, it's my, it's my perception of how those words show up in the world. And I'm also like trying to be, hold myself to a certain way of being that is, that's kind and, caring and, and respectful. And so I just thank you for being willing to answer some of the, my questions of a person who's curious, you know? You're welcome. Yeah. Is there anything like that you would like to leave folks with as we close up? Is there any, is there anything that you want to say or that you feel that people would be helpful for them to understand about the, the book you wrote, about the topic, about the context, about anything else that you feel connected to these masks? Cause I, I do agree that, there's lots of people walking around with masks, and I wondered, um, as we're inviting people to find those safe people they can talk to about the mask, take it off with, and be more of their full self, right? Um, anything that you want to share with folks as we as we close up? I encourage folks to attend a men's or women's weekend. It's a phenomenal experience. However, you're going to get in what you put in, and these weekends are a mirror of how we show up in life. So I've seen men that are late. Generally, they're late in everything that they do. Some men don't bring their homework assignment. Some bring don't bring their food assignment. The weekend is simply a mirror of how I show up in my life. And until somebody else is going to call me out on it, I think everything's fine. Yeah, it's a powerful statement. Until someone called, which is that idea of having a mentor or having an accountability partner or somebody who can help. Because maybe you've just been walking by the mirror every day. You just don't look in it. If it's not broke, why fix it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. When you first started, what was the hardest piece of accountability that you found? When you first started your men's journey, the work with men, what was, for you, what was the hardest part of accountability? To trust that what I said was going to stay there and it wasn't going to get leaked out. The confidentiality piece. And to trust that container because that's a sacred space. And no container is ever the same because there's never the same people that will be there. 
And most people that come to these weekends, there's something that's going on that's traumatic. The men that are coming to these weekends aren't living. Everything's not superb, perfect. However, everybody needs these weekends. But the only people that are going to get help are those that want to in, work on themselves and stop blaming everybody else. Because if you come to a weekend and blame everybody else, you're not going to get anything out of the weekend. You're going to go in thinking you just wasted a lot of time. And the other thing I'll tell you is that we've had people that have come and have had other people pay for them to come to the weekend and they leave after less than a day because there has to be skin in the game. Yeah. Those weekends are powerful. I mean, how, how many have you personally, I mean, do you go to the same one each time or do you go to different ones or how, how do you, I've tried out both secular organizations and more Christian based organizations. I was part of crucible and I've never met so many fake people. What they said was mm. not the walk that they, the talk that they talked was not the walk that they walked. I'd rather be around men, uh, men that believe in all sorts of faiths that are at least transparent and honest and don't gossip about me behind my back. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. And if you have an issue with somebody, go talk to them. Talking about them behind their back doesn't help anybody. It simply undermines that person. You have to have empathy. How would you feel if that person did that to you? Wouldn't feel very good, right? Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, it, I think I want to... I look forward to us having a conversation maybe, you know, outside of this podcast setting, but I think even just in general, because I think I still... I, I find myself having one to ask more questions and I feel like I'm going <laughs> to, we're going to be here for hours. Right. Like what, it, what like I think openly, I, when you say like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. Like I, I believe in that. I, like those things that you say I'm, I'm a hundred percent with. And, and I, then I find it a hard time to reconcile, like, like how we as adults, as men who do this men's work, when we see somebody in our circle and we, they're, they're saying one thing, but they're doing another like, what are the ways that we either pull them in and call them in or we, you know, pull them to the side and say, hey, hey, brother, um, you know, I just want to share something that I'm seeing or that I'm noticing. And it's also also it's from my perspective, because I'm, I'm the outsider looking in. Right. And I, and I think maybe they don't know that what they're saying and what is happening in the circle is different. Right. Maybe they're thinking that they're they're not looking in the mirror. They're actually, you know, looking out a window and they're just saying and then you're like, hmm, that's. That's not what I'm noticing happening with you every week when you show up here. That's, I'm not seeing that, right? And it all depends on how we how we root into reality of ourselves. So I'm, I'm really, I hope we can have another conversation in the future. I think uh, definitely, maybe, maybe maybe just questions I have. Maybe you don't have any questions for me, but I'm, I definitely find myself wanting to ask you more questions. And so I'm an open book. You can go to my website, read my book, and then ask questions. What, tell the folks what the, where they can find your book, where they can find the website. Please share that, and we'll add that in the show notes as well. Bulliedbehindbars.com is my website. My inst I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay. And All of my handles are on my website. Okay. So fantastic. Bulliedbehindbars.com. Uh, we'll put that link in the show notes. Um Matt, Melvin, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing. Let me ask you some questions of curiosity that I had about, um, about the, not only your book, you, about the journey, and I appreciate you. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Hey, folks, um, Matt and I, we just shared our masks here publicly with you. We, we're not inviting you to do that unless you're ready, but you can go to millionmask.org and make a mask anonymously, and then maybe after you make it anonymously, you will find somebody who you're willing to share it with. And that's what we ask you to do. Take care, be well, and hope to have an amazing Independence Day weekend wherever you are in the world. Take care. Bye now. The Taking Off the Mask podcast is produced by Ryan Louie and graphics by Kelly Wong. Guests are managed by Dan Paloma, and the podcast is edited by Samuel Matingo. We'd like to thank everyone who's been a part of the creation of this podcast. And for every guest that has been a part of the show, you are now a part of the Taking Off the Mask family. The Taking Off the Mask podcast is brought to you by the Ever Forward Club. And if you like what you've heard today, please subscribe, write a five-star review, and share this with someone. We look forward to having more conversations that matter. And please remember, there is more to you than anybody can see by just looking at you. <laughs>